Hello, everyone. Here's Johannes Weikmeier, one of the organizers of the Closer Look Journal Club. We're really excited today to have Jill Mittendorf with us and presenting her work um, related to axons and neurons and co collagen and the interaction. Um, Jill is, um, got her PhD from Cornell University, then did a postdoc with Victor Barocos at the University of Minnesota, and is now um, the PI of her own lab at Johns Hopkins as of October 1st. So very much, much settled in and all ready to go, got this under control. Um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to your talk and, and hand over to you. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so this is the title of the paper um, that I was asked to, to talk about. Um, it's long, but in a nutshell, this work and what I'll be talking about today is really all about using discrete fiber network models to understand mechanotransduction and signaling associated with axons. Um, and the paper that I was asked to talk about really focuses on the effects of collagen network heterogeneity. So thinking about how within a tissue, there might be one region that has one density of collagen in another region that has a different density of collagen and how this might be affecting the axon. Um, but I'm also gonna briefly just talk about uh, collagen network viscoelasticity. This is work that is unpublished uh, that I was a part of. Uh, Miriam was really the major driver of this, uh, but I was a, definitely a major part of it as well. Um, and just so everyone is aware, this is work that was done during my postdoc at the University of Minnesota uh, in Victor Barocas's lab. So going into this work, uh, the main, main motivator for this work is that the facet capsular ligament is known to contribute to low back pain and, and just back pain in general. And um, I hope even for this general audience that I don't really have to explain the importance of understanding low back pain. I feel like most people in the room probably know someone who's experiencing it and has really no options for good treatment options. Um, so for those of you unfamiliar with the facet capsule ligament in particular, it's located on the posterior surface of the facet joint, um, and the facet joint is located on the posterior side of the spine. Uh, you can see a little schematic of it here. It contains articular cartilage on the ends of your bones, and then your ligament and it kind of encapsulates the joint. This ligament is important to the spinal motion and stability, or to the motion of the spine and the stability of the spine. And, Therefore, it's important to the overall health and function of the spine. Um, in addition, we know that this particular joint undergoes arthritis and it undergoes arthritis and these degenerative changes at a similar rate to that of the intervertebral disc. So it's actually very difficult to tell when the disc is causing someone pain versus the facet joint causing someone pain. Now, what we do know about this ligament, or at least the healthy ligament, um, is that the ligament's properties are highly heterogeneous. Uh, so if we look at, say, nine different regions of this ligament uh, using like something like SEM or just the biochemical composition in general, you'll see that the fibers are not all isotropic. They're not all aligned in the same direction. They also have um, you know, different regions, some of a little bit denser collagen and some of a little bit less dense collagen. Um, what we'll also see here is that if you take the ligament while it's still on the bone, as in this image, or maybe detach it from the bone and biaxially load it, such as what's in this image, uh, you'll get strain fields that are highly heterogeneous. So some regions have lower strain and some regions have highly, higher strain. Um, so the tissue definitely has you know, regional variability. Um, what also is important to know with this particular tissue is that the ligament does contain embedded neurons. And it's believed that these neurons embedded in the ligament itself is the, one of the many reasons that the facet joint might be causing people pain and this ligament itself might be causing people pain. So um, when we think of, or when I um, think about neurons, there's some really interesting studies out there where they've taken DRGs, put them into some collagen gels and then stretch those collagen gels. And what you see is the axonal growth from those GRGs when stretched um, will increase their expression of pain signaling molecules such as substance P and phosphorylated ERK. And this is in comparison to the unstretched control gels. And what's also really interesting about this work is that when you uh, change the strain that you apply, you can see that um, there, an activation threshold almost begins to emerge at which below this threshold, uh, the 
the axons don't express much uh, signaling molecules. And before that, above that threshold, they do uh, express signaling molecules. Um, and it's believed that that activation threshold is somewhere between um, 10 and 20% um, strain. Now, the next thing we know about uh, this particular, or about these GRGs and this collagen gels is that Increase, uh, stretching the gels, no matter whether you're in a isotropically aligned network or um, a night, um, little more aligned collagen fiber um, gel, you'll get increased expression of signaling. And in the aligned gels, you'll actually get slightly more increased expression of signaling than in the isotropic gels. Uh, you'll also see, you can also see or we've seen in experiments that the collagen density of the gel can potentially change the expression of substance B and phosphorylated ERK, so these pain-associated signaling molecules. And so the scientist in me says, you know, why would these changes in collagen density and alignment of the collagen in these gels actually cause some of these changes in signaling, um, especially when these gels are um, being stretched to the same amount or stretched to the same uh, percentage? Uh, and the mechanical engineer in me says, well, maybe this is just a change in the force that gets transmitted to the axon that is embedded in that gel, and that's causing the axon, whose overall stiffness isn't changing in the two different experiments, um, to stretch more. And so to try to get at this, we can use discrete fiber network modeling approaches. And so this is actually a study that has done, been done previously in the Barocas lab. Um, and what they did with this particular study is they uh, took an axon, embedded it in a discrete fiber network uh, where the um, fibers of the discrete fiber network were meant to represent collagen fibers. And they chose a collagen volume fraction for this particular study to be equal or similar to that of the facet capsular ligament so that they could uh, precisely model what they think might be happening in uh, to an axon that might be embedded in the ligament itself. Uh, in this study as well, they varied the collagen concentrations uh, because, again, that ligament is not, does not always have the exact one concentration. It might vary from person to person. And they arranged the, uh, they varied the alignment of the collagen fibers in the ligament. They also loaded this, um, uh, this, this network in three different directions, a transverse, an axial, and a shear direction. And so what they saw when they did this study is that when you look at your axon and the strain across the surface of the axon, you see some heterogeneous strain fields. And then you can quantify these heterogeneous strain fields by looking at the average strain that the axon experiences and the top 1% of strains that the axon experiences. So if you take every single element in that axon and you average those strains, you can get the average axon strain. And if you look at only the top 1% of axon strains, that's the top 1% of axon strains. Um, and so what you see here is from this model is that as you increase uh, the anisotropy or the alignment of your fibers in your discrete fiber networks or in your collagen fibers, you get an increase in the average axon strain. Um, you can also see this increase in average stra axon strain when you increase the density. Um, these trends don't uh, hold true for anisotropy and the top 1% of strains, but it does not seem to hold true quite as much for the collagen, increasing collagen density in the top 1% of axon strains. Um, and so all of this work was really good, but it really only looked at uniform uh, collagen fiber networks. Um, but one of the maybe potential biggest benefits of this particular approach and using this discrete fiber network approach is that you get these heterogeneous strain fields. Whereas if we took this axon and just put it into a continuum model, uh, such as what's uh, shown over here on the right, uh, this, so let me back up. This axon on the left was embedded in a discrete fiber network model. The axon on the right was embedded into a block that was given the same anisotropic properties as the discrete fiber network, but it was just a continuous um, block. And so, the one on the right has more continuous, um, doesn't have nearly as heterogeneous of a strain field as the one on the left. And this can be quantified and was quantified in that previous work uh, where we saw that the peak strains on the axon really weren't very different than the average strains in the continuum model, but were different in the discrete fiber network model. 
And I say all this because um, the those activation thresholds that I talked about before, we don't necessarily need the entire axon to surpass those activation thresholds to increase signaling of the axon. This small region, which reached a very high strain, might be enough to activate a threshold, a signaling pathway or a threshold or activate uh, pain associated um, uh, signaling. And so, for my particular study, I use this discrete fiber network, but I wanted to answer the question of what about collagen heterogeneity? So what if that network that surrounds this axon isn't one density or isn't one alignment, um, or, and it, what if it's two different types of density? And so the goal for my particular study was to understand the effects of local collagen heterogeneity on axon strain fields using a discrete fiber network model. And so this is the model that I set up in use. Um, it's got an axon shown here in red, embedded in a discrete fiber network shown in black. Each one of those lines represents a collagen fiber. Um, the collagen fibers themselves were modeled as nonlinear springs. There were two force elements or connector elements for those who are familiar with abacus. Um, you can see the coefficients for them over here, and these were taken directly from um, literature, and I should have those citations here, but I don't. Um, so if you're interested, check out the paper for those citations. Um, the, the collagen fibers uh, were connected to the axon um, directly to the node that nearest, uh, was nearest to where it intersected the axon. So if a fiber intersected the axon, that fiber was adjusted so that it would just be attached to the node nearest its intersection point. We then created these focal adhesion fibers, uh, four focal adhesion fibers to represent the adhesion, you know, represent actual focal adhesion fibers. Those were also modeled as nonlinear springs. Um, the axon itself was measured, was modeled as a composite material that contained uh, microtubules that ran the length of the axon. And those microtubules were embedded in a linear elastic background modulus uh, to create the body of the axon. Um, you can see some more constants over here. These are also all taken from literature. Um, then each network was stretched to 20% axial loading, uh, where axial loading is a long relative to the length of the long axis of the axon. For the actual uh, heterogeneous, the discrete fiber networks, um, I chose three different types of heterogeneous or three different types of networks, a homogeneous network and then two heterogeneous networks, a sparse center and a dense center network. Um, and so the homogeneous networks are exactly as they sound. So they have relatively uniform uh, collagen densities and they have relatively uniform um, collagen alignment or fiber alignment. Um, they were chosen to be either isotropic alignments of the fibers or aligned fiber or uh, an aligned fiber alignment. Uh, these so collagen. Can I ask, can I ask yeah. a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, is the focal adhesion, do you know if that is necessary for the model? Like, have there been experiments to show that their absence affects the material properties of the system? So, yeah, so the focal adhesion attachment sites, so we included them in there because there are studies that say focal adhesion fibers exist between the axons and the collagen networks, and that's one of the ways yeah. they are attached. Um, one of the issues with us, particularly with this model of not including them, is then we basically have a point load on the surface mm -hmm. of our axon, um, and that point load um, just doesn't seem quite as physiologically relevant. Um, it also causes the system not to converge. Um, so mm -hmm. you kind of have a couple of different issues if you don't include some focal adhesion fibers. However, there's definitely work that can be done to improve the validity of the number of focal adhesion fibers and the stiffness of those focal adhesion fibers and that connection, because I don't think we know what that is. Mm -hmm either experimentally or computationally, and that could totally modify the results that I'll show you in a little bit. Cool, thanks. Okay, um, okay. so with the homogeneous networks, uh, the collagen volume fractions were chosen to be similar to that of a two meg per mil collagen gel, which is what those experiments that I showed you at the beginning used. Uh, we did vary it uh, a good amount just in 
um, to get a good variety of collagen volume fractions. Then for the heterogeneous networks, so for the sparse center network, uh, we had low collagen volume fraction immediately surrounding the axon. And that low collagen volume fraction region was surrounded by a high collagen volume fraction region. Uh, the dense center network was exactly the opposite with a dense collagen region immediately surrounding the axon. And that was surrounded by a much lower uh, density collagen network. Um, and then what you'll notice over here in this chart is that there are um, variations in the global collagen volume fraction of the dense center and sparse center network. These changes in global collagen volume fraction were created by changing the radius of the center region. Um, so if you change the size of the sparse center region from something small like 1.5 microns to something larger, 1.8 or 18 microns, then your overall density of that collagen network will decrease because you're increasing the size of the low density region. Um, so in these, I did not change the ratio of the density of the low collagen region to the high collagen region, just change the radius of it. Um, so the last thing is um, all networks were created to be a box of 60 by 60 by 60 microns. Um, and then the diameter of the axon was one, one micron. Um, okay, so diving into some of our results, what we first look at when we, on this slide, is only the homogeneous networks. Over on the left are um, strain fields of the axon. Um, and so what you'll see is uh, the low density axon is shown here, uh, an axon in a high density collagen network is shown here. The high density collagen network clearly has more um, strain on the axon just due to the color of it being this lighter blue, not this darker blue. When we zoom in on the regions of highest strain, we see again that the, you know, that we have red here and no red here. So there's much higher strain um, in the higher density collagen network. So when we quantify the strain maps um, and calculate the average axon strain versus the global collagen volume fraction, what we see is that there is an increase in axon strain versus the global collagen volume fraction. And we also see that there is a increase in the top 1% of strains versus global collagen volume fraction. Um, and so this is true for both the isotropic networks, which is this black line and the aligned uh, collagen networks, which is this gray line. Um, and what should be noted here as well is that there is a slight difference between the isotropic and the aligned collagen fiber networks where the aligned is slightly larger. And if we go back to that study that I showed you at the beginning, there is a slight increase as well between the more isotropic collagen gel that was stretched versus the more aligned collagen gel that was stretched. Um, so that's good. That means that our model might actually be explaining a little bit about uh, the signaling of these axons. So this next slide, I will be showing you information about the dense center networks. So specifically, I'll be, um, so just to remind you again, um, in these studies, I varied the radius of the center region. Um, and so again, we have axon strain maps. On the left is a uh, axon strain map from a network with a small radius of the center region. And uh, this one is of a large radius of the center region. What you can see when you look at these two maps comparing them together is there really isn't much difference in the axon strain field. Um, and you can see that as well when you look at uh, kind of the zoomed in region of some of the high strain region. And we can quantify these strains uh, simply by looking at, or we can quantify these strains. Uh, so when we look at the average axon strain versus the radius of the center region, we see that there's not a lot of change in that um, axon strain uh, or the average axon strain, except for maybe this uh, one value here, which is the aligned collagen networks with a large radius of the center region. Um, and just to remind you, this is 18 micron radius uh, where the edge of the box would be at 30 microns. Uh, so then um, this down lower one is the top 1% of axon strains. And again, we see that there's very little change in the top 1% of axon strains versus changing the radius of the center region. So essentially what we're showing here is the 
fact that we have an inclusion or the fact that we have a very dense region immediately surrounding this axon seems to be more important than the size of this dense region surrounding the axon. Um, and when we look at the sparse center networks, we actually see a very similar story where when we compare the strain fields on the surface of these uh, two, two axons, one from a small radius network, one from a large radius network, we see that their strain fields are relatively similar. Um, that's true for the isotropic networks and the aligned networks. Um, and when we quantify the strains in these axons, and by looking at the average strain on the axon versus the radius of that center region, we see that there's very little change in that average strain on the axon. And that's true as well when we look at the top 1% of strains on the axon. So again, the fact that there is an inclusion um, may be more important than the size of that inclusion. Uh, but in this particular study, what we really cared about more um, than anything else was, you know, do these heterogeneous networks um, cause differences when compared to the homogeneous networks? And so on this slide, I'm actually comparing the homogeneous and the heterogeneous networks. And so <clears throat> when we look at the average strain on the axon, Compared to homogeneous networks, these dense center networks shown here with the diamonds do increase the average strain that the axon experiences. Whereas when we look at the top 1% of strains that the axon experiences, uh, this dense center network has very little effect. <clears throat> now, if we look at the sparse center networks, we can actually see in comparison to the homogeneous networks, which are these circles and the shaded region in the middle here, um, that they'll decrease the average strain that they, the axon experiences. And when we look at the top 1% of strains that the axon experiences, um, they have very little effect. Um, and the way that we felt we were able to compare these was by using the global collagen volume fraction. So using the total amount of collagen within a given network, um, within a given uh, box that was examined during this, this computational model. Um, and so what this means is that the distribution of axon strains uh, on um, is heterogeneous or in heterogeneous networks is distinct from that of the homogeneous networks. So there are more elements that are experiencing larger strains in the dense center networks in comparison to the homogeneous networks. And there are more elements experiencing lower strains in the sparse center networks in comparison to homogeneous networks with similar global collagen volume fractions. Um, so this is really kind of the money slide of this paper and the really like take home messages here. But one of the other things we did in this paper was really try to answer the question of like, why, why is this happening and why do these dense center and sparse center networks kind of shift these axon strain fields? And so one of the first things we looked at was, okay, does the overall properties of the network change in your um, you know, sparse center versus homogeneous and dense center versus homogeneous networks? So the way we looked at this was looking at the secant modulus. Um, and so for those of you who don't remember what this is, if you plot the stress versus strain for some nonlinear sample, your secant modulus would be uh, the modulus you would get if you just put a point at 0% and 20% strain and calculated that, um, that slope. So when you increase your global collagen volume fraction for isotropic or for homogeneous isotropic networks, you can see an increase in that modulus, and that makes sense. When you um, compare your sparse center networks shown in these triangles here with the homogeneous networks, what we see is the difference between the homogeneous and the sparse center is actually relatively small, especially compared to the difference between, say, the radius 18 sparse center network and the radius 1.5 sparse center network. Similarly, the similar story can actually be said for the dense center networks versus the homogeneous networks. So the dense center are these um, diamonds shown here. Sometimes they're a little bit larger. Sometimes they're a little bit lower than the dense center networks or than the homogeneous networks, which is the center line. Um, but in reality, they're relatively close to being a sim they're more sim they are relatively close to the homogeneous networks in comparison to you know, the difference between uh, the, the individual dense center networks that were created. And so what, what this was telling me was that, okay, the force on the exterior on the boundary of these networks is not changing nearly enough to cause that increase in stress or increase in axon strain 
that we saw in the dense center networks or decreasing nearly enough to cause that decrease in axon strain that we saw in the sparse center networks. So the next thing I looked at was the distribution of forces within each network. Um, and so each one of these columns is an individual network. Over on the left, we have three um, networks of, uh, of the isotropic collagen alignments. And then on the right, we have more aligned collagen networks. Um, each one of the lines in each one of these networks represents a collagen fiber. Uh, that color of that collagen fiber is indicative of the force of which that um, fiber is experiencing when this network was stretched to 20% strain. So if you see a yellow line, that means that fiber experienced a lot of force. If you see a dark blue line, it means that fiber experienced very little force. So when we look at the distribution of forces in, say, this homogeneous isotropic network, we see that it's relatively uniform. That seems to be true as well when we look at the um, uh, homogeneous network with aligned collagen fibers. But when we look at our dense center networks and our sparse center networks, we see that the low collagen volume fraction region has much higher fiber forces than the more dense regions, um, especially the dense regions that are surrounding the axon, um, or in this case, the dense region on the periphery in the sparse center network. And so if we think back to some of the results before where we saw that increase in the average strain due to the dense center network, um, was there a question? Okay. Um, so what we see is that um, it's not, so this increase in strain on the axon must be caused by the fact that there are more fibers attached to the axon as opposed to the fact that these fibers, each individual fiber is transmitting more force to the embedded axon. Um, and the opposite can be said for uh, the sparse center networks where there's less fibers attached, therefore the axon strain is less. Um, and you can see that same trend occurring with the aligned networks over on the right. <clears throat> so in conclusion for this particular paper, what we saw was that local heterogeneity surrounding these axons can cause increased axon strain um, and this is really important to kind of keep in mind when we are thinking about this, um, this the, the signaling of these axons in various uh, forms of collagen gels and collagen um, uh, mat collagenous materials, uh, because they're not always homogeneous. And sometimes those axons, especially when they grow, they like to grow into regions of low density collagen. And so maybe this is a little bit of a protective mechanism in the body uh, that they grow into regions of low density collagen where the stretch and the strain of that um, ligament per se might not necessarily cause them to stretch as much. Uh, but in, in addition, we really showed here as well the importance of thinking about using discrete fiber network modeling to understand uh, these axons simply because of this theoretical axon signaling threshold. And without it, we might not have seen, um, um, and that's because um, the, you know, you only need some one small region of the axon to surpass the, uh, the signaling threshold in order to cause increased uh, sense, uh, production of pain signaling associated with mo molecules. So <clears throat> moving on into um, the next part, which is some unpublished work and will hopefully uh, get submitted relatively soon about collagen network viscoelasticity. Um, and again, this was um, done more by Miriam, um, but with my help. Uh, so the motivation for this particular work is that uh, high-speed loading of the facet capsule ligament can cause increased damage and pain. And so those high-speed loading events could occur maybe if you got into a car accident or maybe if you're a football player um, and, you know, your head basically, you know, you under your head, neck undergo whiplash, right? So your head moves forward really fast, back really fast, and then kind of, you know, back to a neutral position. Um, and so this type of an impact uh, is known to cause all sorts of problems. Um, so in mouse studies where they've caused, uh, where they've um, impacted the joint or impacted the facet capsule ligament, they've seen that afterwards, those mice are very sensitive to, um, like pinpricks and uh, will withdraw their paws uh, to slight sensations of pain um, at much higher rates than those who have not undergone um, that high speed loading impact event. 
Um, similarly, these impact events are known to cause increased inflammation in the joints. They're known to cause damage to the fibers in the ligament. Um, and so they cause all sorts of different issues here. Uh, so, but in this particular study, we really wanted to just think about how this high speed loading of the facet capture ligament can impact the axons that might be embedded in the ligament. Um, and so our goal was to understand the effects of high speed loading on embedded axons. And so for this particular section of the, um, the, the talk, or we, we took those discrete fiber network models that I used previously, but instead of using uh, modeling each fiber as a nonlinear spring element, we used a prony series where we, um, and it was a four component one where um, you can see the equation for it here and you can see the um, schematic of it down here. Um, there were, you know, so there's five different springs and four different dash pots located in series and parallel um, to explain um, the force uh, versus stretch curve. And so in order to get these particular coefficients, we actually did, or our collaborators had some experimental data where they stretched collagen gels at different rates and looked at the stress, uh, stress versus time curves. And then we took our networks before we put the axons in and we modeled those network or, and we uh, optimized the coefficients so that the behavior of those networks matched that of the experiments. Um, and you can see these are four different uh, experiments and you can see the fitting of the simulation data to the experiments. Uh, so that's the line versus the dots. And they do relatively well. So once we had that, we then, you know, stuck the axon into this network, um, attached it to the collagen, you know, using the same method as before and with some focal adhesion fibers as well. Uh, and then each network was stretched using seven different strain rates. And so kind of going right into some of those results, what we have is the lowest strain rate, which is almost quasi static loading. And then we have a very high strain rate um, where this encompasses you know, some of the strain rates that you might see during those whiplash events. And um, what we see here when we plot the average axon strain versus time is that not surprisingly, the lowest strain rate takes the longest amount of time to reach its peak value. Um, and the, the highest strain rate, which is this blue one here, uh, takes the least amount of time to reach its peak value. Um, what might be a little more surprising is that all, uh, all of these curves, including the lowest strain rate, do reach a peak value and then um, relax back to some equilibrium strain uh, further, further out on this curve. Um, and then what's also quite interesting is that when we look at the top 1% of axon strains, um, the magnitude of these strains is almost an order of magnitude larger than the average strain on the axon. Um, and so this is just uh, really important to keep in mind, um, especially when we kind of think about some of that, those thresholding of, of that pain signaling thresholds. Um, the other thing we can do with this data is we can look at those peak strains and the equilibrium strains versus the strain rate that was applied. So when we look at the peak strains, what we see is that as you increase the strain rate, you see an increase in that peak strain value, although it does seem to plateau, plateau somewhere around approximately 7% per second. Um, and then in addition, we also have the equilibrium strain values that's shown down here in gray. Um, note this equilibrium value was taken further out on the time curve. It's just that I didn't want to show you all of that curve. Um, and there isn't a lot of change in this equilibrium um, axon strain value. Um, and that's to be expected, right? Because uh, when time goes to infinity, many terms in those Prony series end up going to zero and you're left with only the one um, coefficient. Um, and so I wanted to just go through this section of the talk really briefly. Uh, and so uh, hopefully you're able to see that. Can I ask, axon another, can I ask another question, Jill? Sure. Um, it seems that in, so in your plot on the very left, do you think that, so you, I'm guessing you're plotting like the mean average max principal strain. Did you see it? To me, it seems like there's a wider range. So 
did you look at those on a Gaussian curve, for example, and see like a broader range so that like more of your axons are getting an even higher strains at uh, the higher strain rates? Yeah, so I didn't look at, we didn't look at them specifically on that type of a curve, um, but what we, so one of the reasons I think we have such large ranges is in the data I'm showing you here, we did again use the densities of some of those collagen gels. Um, so they're very low density gels. And so they don't actually intersect the axon at that many locations. Um, and so even though we do have focal adhesion fibers kind of you know, making it such that there's not a point load on it, um, it really is concentrated you know, in only a couple locations, you know, maybe, I don't know, 10, 20 locations along the entire length of the axon. Um, and so I think, you know, and there's a little bit of variability in the networks and the number of fibers that intersect. Uh, so I, I think um, that's what's maybe causing some of the, and then the angle of the fiber that goes into the axon, you know, whether or not that's, you know, more in the direction of our load or perpendicular to the direction of our load, um, I think some of those variables is probably what's causing some of our variation here in the peak strains. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, um, hopefully you saw that um, the axon strains do appear to be sensitive to the rate at which we load these, these um, tissues. And uh, this could be important for thinking about axon signaling thresholds, especially because, you know, the top 1% of strains were an order of magnitude larger than the average strain on the axon. But another place I think that this might be important to think about is um, within the CTE community. Um, so this is actually a picture from a study where they, you know, grew some DRGs and axons in a dish, and then they put a puff of you know, air really quickly on the axons. And what they see is fiber breakage and fiber axon swelling. Um, and it's unclear to me how much strain that these axons actually are experiencing, but it's possible that these strain values we, that we measured over here during uh, this viscoelastic study might be more um, in line with the strains that they might be experiencing in this CTE study. Um, in the sense that, you know, during these whiplash events, we might actually be experiencing um, large enough strains that we could be damaging the axons in addition to just uh, activating signaling pathways associated with pain. And so um, that brings me to the end of the two major things I really wanted to talk about today, which was using discrete fiber network models to understand mechanodrone suction and axon signaling. Um, but as a new professor, I just want to like super briefly mention some of the things I'm thinking about using this uh, for in the future. Um, and so specifically, I've been thinking about using discrete fiber network modeling to um, understand non-neuronal responses. And so this goes back to a little bit of my PhD work where I really thought about cartilage and tissue engineered cartilage. So chondrocytes within that is actually really interesting to me. And so some of the things I've been thinking about is if you put a chondrocyte in a discrete fiber network and you look at the strains, could we associate those strain fields with um, studies of impacts on cartilage where the cells have been shown to die in regions of high strain versus regions of, um, and they die um, again at some strain signaling threshold. Similarly, um, when you shear cartilage that has been damaged, you can see changes in their, um, uh, mitre, uh, they'll undergo uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. And so maybe could we think about, you know, some of these things, some of these biological responses of the chondrocytes with respect to some of these discrete fiber network models. Um, and so those are some of the things I'm thinking about in the future and building, using building on. Um, and so with that, um, I got to definitely thank the people at Minnesota, the Barocas Lab, the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute, our funding sources. Um, if you have more questions, here's the paper link. And then this is also my new email. Thank you so much for this really fun talk. The first question that is unrelated to science, how did you, how do you get this done with Zoom to have that type of uh, background? <laughs> uh, what, well, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> How do you get the mascot in the back to look exactly right? Ah, yeah. So um, you can actually grab anyone's picture on Zoom oh, okay. and um, move it around. Um, so 
Victor went through and figured out how big he needed to crop that image so that, and then everyone made that their background. And then you can just move people around um, and then take a screenshot. Great. Thank, thank you for indulging that question. But uh, I'm glad you asked more... it, Johannes. For once, I'm not the weird guy. <laughs> well, I'm opening it up now. So it's your time to shine again, man. <laughs> I literally had the same question. I was like, did you Photoshop this or did you actually <laughs> do it? <laughs> so, so, so it, does anyone have like a, a science related question? I, I actually have a, a serious question. Um, first of all, I really appreciate you again being here and I really enjoyed that talk. Um, I'm interested about the cost, computational cost of these simulations. Can you give me just kind of a sense for how expensive one of these, these um, volume elements was to run? Yeah, so I did all of mine. Um, so not the viscoelastic one, the, the first study. I did all of mine on either my laptop or a desktop computer. They took anywhere from like some of the lower collagen volume fraction ones took like, I don't know, two minutes. And then the more um, dense collagen ones took maybe closer to like an hour. Um, okay. And so how many fibers are there approximately? Oof. Um, Sorry. Great <laughs> I, I don't remember. We're, we're um, running our networks right now, so I'm just trying to get a sense. <laughs> I feel like, so my axons were one diameter by 30 micron long. And I feel like on the lower density ones, they always had at least 10 to 15 fibers intersecting them. And then the higher density ones had hundreds intersecting them. Okay. So. Um, and so that's just, and then it was a 60 by 60 by 60 box. Um, so on the order of thousands, I would guess? That's probably about right. Okay. Um, so my, my <laughs> follow-up question now is, um, obviously that's feasible because you're, these fibers are relatively simple from a mechanical formulation perspective. How much do you think that would impact the results if you were to use, you know, some sort of more accurate beam formulation, say, to more yeah. simple? Um, yeah. Like, what, what, what do you think the sensitivity of your results would be for that? Because the computational cost would go dramatically up. Oh, right? for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, it's, yeah, there's a couple of different thoughts I have on that. Um, so, with using the beam elements, I think the, the stiffness of them in bending is gonna be really important for some of those more compression studies or shear studies. Um, I think it's probably less critical in your tension studies. Um, but then with the benefit of being able to, of using a beam element. So I used all of these networks are Delaunay triangulation is how they were formulated. So randomly seeding nodes into the box area and then doing a Delaunay triangulation and then getting a network. Um, and I've toyed with other um, networks um, with, less no with less fibers going into each node. Um, so like only um, like a Voronoi network, which sometimes might be more representative of a collagen gel, but it only has like four fibers into a node. And so, you can't use your two force elements because then every node is under constraint. Um, so there your beam element would be um, more valuable and more important. Um, it would most definitely increase computational time. I don't know how much. Um, and then also, I'm not quite sure what I would use for the bending stiffness specifically. I know there's a whole bunch of people who look at networks and they're like, bending stiffness matters a whole bunch. and I'm not sure what is most relevant for collagen. Um, maybe I just run, you know, compared to the gel studies, kind of like what we did in the viscoelasticity portion of the talk and run, run it until the bending stiffness match the sheer stiffness of a collagen gel or something. Um, yeah, so I, I feel like I kind of rounded about that question, but yeah, no, it's something I've thought about, yeah. but I don't have great answers. Right, awesome. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Is there another question? I'm, yeah, go ahead, Catherine. Oh, hi, thank you so much for the great talk. And then so much, um, I'm, I'm more like a student, PhD student from mechanics background. So I was very intrigued to ask uh, whether there is some effort into linking this 
uh, the first part of the talk with some theoretical analysis. Um, particular, I guess I can see the um, they share some common features with polymer science, um, those kind of theoretical models. I was wondering if that's what people in the community of bioengineering are generally interested in, or are people more generally interested in um, combining experimental measurement and uh, numerical measurement for discovery? Yeah, I would say I'm definitely more interested in the combining of the experimental measurements with the um, computational measurements um, of the study to try to you know see how much of the experiment can the computational model explain and then you know can we use that computational model to maybe predict what things we can't measure or things that are more difficult to measure right like in your human facet capsule ligament it one really difficult to get um, and then two like really difficult to get when the axons are still alive that you can actually run something like a, a study on that. Um, I would say the relationship to the polymer community, if we were to kind of make that shift or that switch would be um, probably more applicable to if we wanted to think about this with respect to like tissue engineering or not just collagen gels, but maybe other fibrous um, scaffolds or um, uh, gels, you know, uh, that um, maybe are, are, are important to that community and in, in those aspects. I see. And can I ask a follow-up question about the great computational work you have done? So uh, I guess like some of our research project with like more ordered system uh, based on fibers, we have, I guess we're lucky in the sense that we, we have like a good mathematical function to describe the parametric function of like the geometry at initialization. But I imagine for your work, it's, I guess it probably would be a little more challenging to have a good guess about the initialization of the geometry, right? So how, um, like, do you have any great insight to share in that part? Yeah, um, so there's, so, so what we did is we made sure that the collagen volume fraction matched that of collagen gels. Um, so the, the volume of collagen to the overall volume of the, the element um, matched what it theoretically should be in a collagen gel based on the mm -hmm. concentration of collagen we put in it. Okay. Um, so, so that's kind of the biggest one. We also um, matched our alignment of the fibers with what we can measure mm -hmm. in experiments using mm -hmm. things like SHG yep. um, on your confocal microscope. Um, so those are kind of the two biggest parameters that we actually matched. Some of the more other more detailed parameters, like how many fibers intersect at a single node, what is the bending stiffness of at that node? Um, I think those things are much more up in the air and a lot more difficult to um, determine experimentally and implement computationally. Um, you know, maybe that's something that we could use this type of an approach to just kind of figure out. Um, you know, very. I'm not quite sure how we would vary it experimentally, but maybe we could do it kind of that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Who else? Emma. Yeah, thanks so much for your talk, Jill. It's really cool to see this other part of your work. Um, I know that you also have some experience with looking at sort of continuum models of, of similar tissue. Um, do you have any thoughts on on sort of, you know, how these two kind of um, modeling frameworks tie together and whether or not there's kind of potential for, for properly linking across scales? Um, I know that's another really challenging question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, so there's definitely multi-scale modeling um, and multi-scale modeling frameworks. Um, Victor's got a few that he uses. Um, Unfortunately, I like haven't partnered them together um, all that much, but I do think, um, especially, I guess I think about this again, kind of in moving forward into some of my future work of like the cartilage, right? Um, cartilage impact studies, that surface region is not only under compression, right? And some regions because of the heterogeneity and cartilage are undergoing some one set of strains and tension and compression and shear and other regions are going under other things. So I think, you know, you could definitely kind of think about, okay, you know, we have tensile and compressive loading over here, and we have, you know, shear and 
compression over here. And so, okay, they're going to behave whatever, if something's in this region versus this region, it's going to behave differently in a network that is in that region. Um, so I guess that's kind of how I think about it just in general. No, that makes sense. I, I think um, it's like a, it, it's sort of like a grand challenge type of question um, from sort of the, the modeling biological systems perspective, at least in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think there's, there's different ways of like directly partnering them together. Um, and then I think there's also like a, you can kind of do the models side by side and just say, okay, this corresponds to this region and this corresponds to this region. And so it, it kind of, I think, depends on what exactly you want to get out of your model of how necessary it is to directly partner them together. Because you could, like um, one of Victor's models, basically they run the large scale continuum model and then like the, um, they'll change or modify the lower scale model and then that'll update the larger model and then it kind of runs in a loop until um, they've reached the desired point, so. I, one thing that I'm thinking about is uh, right now you have sort of, you vary the distribution of fibers along the, or transfers to the, to the axon, right? Where you vary the, the radial um, density of collagen. Do you have, do you think you could use this actually to look at um, variations of heterogeneity along the axon to sort of study how axons, leaving white matter into gray matter, or that would be the central nervous system, but also in the peripheral nervous system, um, innervating a different tissue uh, to, to sort of look at the, the damage or, or loading distribution along the axon if, if it transitions to different materials. Sure. Um, yeah, I definitely think that's a thing you could do. Um, you could definitely make like the lower half of, you know, just embed your ax axon differently into the network. Um, or, you know, you can make networks with all sorts of different densities and variations and like alignments in one region and alignments in other regions. Um, I think some things are a little more difficult than others. And then kind of that transition between like maybe the dense region and the other, the less dense region is sometimes a little bit complicated of like how quickly do you want that to transition um, and implementing it. Uh, but yeah, I, you could definitely do that. Um, and then you could potentially think about, you know, where along that axon. So say you put it in top half in low density, bottom half of the axon in high density, you could think about like where along that axon are you experiencing high strains? Like, is there some concentration in, or is it all just in the high density region or do you have weird stress concentrations because of that transition from the high to the low? Um, I think that could definitely be a thing. Okay, does anyone else would like to ask something? Then thank you, Jill, so much for giving this talk. It was really nice. We enjoyed it a lot. And uh, do you want to pitch your lab for any of the, <laughs> the call? Yeah, I'm looking for students. Um, <laughs> so people interested in musculoskeletal biomechanics. Um, I do more than just modeling. I have some experimental stuff that is slowly getting built up. Um, so if you're interested in moving to Baltimore and doing Johns Hopkins research. I'm looking for people. <laughs> well, thank you so much.